Uh, greetings again, everybody. Uh, welcome back. And I'm delighted to introduce Mira Hertz. Now, I believe, I don't know the detail, but I believe she's going to be uh, talking about sensing potatoes. And there's there's been already been so many, uh, not so many, but quite a number of presentations that are kind of delving into the same area of um, communicating with what we all too often ignorantly think of as inanimate or not so animate. Um, so I'm most intrigued to hear what you have to share with this mirror. So thanks for joining us. I'm going to leave you the stage to you now, and I'll be back at the end. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Richard. And thank you for having me um, and inviting me to this conference, first of all. Um, yeah, so you're right. Um, I will actually not talk so much, hopefully, but um, what I want to do today is I, I couldn't be there in person, nor my performance, unfortunately. So um, what I want to do is share a pre-recorded um, performance with you, which kind of then also became more of a video piece because it's pre-recorded and it's a work in progress. So it maybe just to frame that um, it is um, an ongoing work for me. Um, and it is titled Sensing Potatoes, exactly. But before um, before I start, I will maybe say a few words. Also because um, everybody who's joining us, I would like to ask you that if you have the possibility, if you're maybe at home or if, there's, if you're at the conference and there's a kitchen somewhere or something, if you can get, hand of a, uh, get hold of a potato, then please do so um, and i'm going to promise i'm going to talk for maybe two or three minutes so that you will have time to fetch one if you don't have one and you have another kind of vegetable then then please feel free to do that if you don't have any of that um, or you don't feel like getting one that's also completely fine um, the video will contain some some scores for for viewers um, kind of participatory moments um, but you can always um, also just imagine um, being with a potato. It sounds very weird when I say it like that, um, and it's hopefully also going to be a little bit uh, or contain a little bit of humor. Okay, so while you maybe are wandering off to get one, don't worry if you if you miss a bit of that. What I'm going to say, um, um, maybe just to to frame a tiny bit about myself because it maybe makes sense for what I'm going to share with you. Um, I am um, I'm a performance artist and um, somatic dance artist and I did though train first of all in art theory and philosophy and then kind of wandered off after that and uh, trained in creative practice and somatic dance and I think uh, even though I really don't want to put like a really um, you know, I think none of us want to do that, like a flat binary of uh, practice and theory or um, sensing and thinking or something like that. I don't want to reproduce that. But I do feel um, maybe a little bit of a, of, a, of a discussion sometimes inside of me or inside of my practice between this very uh, theoretical um, approach and a approach that is very much um, trying to, from a subjective um, sensorial view, trying to work through things, and that they're not really fighting, but in a, in, a, in a dialogue with each other. And I think what I want to show you is also coming a little bit out of that dialogue. Um, so in recent years, I have been wondering a lot about um, how the ecological crisis makes me rethink which kind of stories I do want to tell or convey in, in my performances. Um, and um, coming also from a theoretical um, background or historical background, of course, um, human stories have been told most of the time because the human being is in the foreground. And this has already been said um, numerous times in this conference. Um, so I don't really have to irritate that. But um, also for me, it is in my practice, not about kind of getting rid of the human being or its stories, but rather about um, um, the contrary that I feel like I just need to re-question what is the human being or really specifically my position in the world. Um, how do I relate to world? How, how do I, which tools do I have in order to wonder about that actually? Um, 
so I got really curious in how in performance, in the aesthetic of performance, the story of performance, um, the process of it, how do I include or maybe even give the stage to non-human complexities or human non-human complexities and entanglements? Um, how can I mediate these kind of complexities and how can they inform the aesthetics um, of my artistic practice? And this is really a big question for me. So not just not just the content, but but how how do they inform the aesthetics? Um, and I think this is the moment where I'm just going to share my video with you which is going to be about 20 minutes and hopefully let it speak for itself. And afterwards I can contextualize a bit more, but also if there are any questions, um, yeah, I would be happy. Okay. Here we go. Redirect your gaze whenever you want to towards real or imaginary this compact thing, irregular shaped, exuberantly organic form, yes a potato, like we immediately think of a potato when we think about the idea of an organic shape. How did it get here? Where did you get it from? How did it get to the place where you got it from? Is it the white potato or another kind of potato? What do you associate? Maybe that we sit down at the table with fork and knife in our hand, sword is available. It's steaming hot yellowish white and soft with that starchy smell, stomach warming carbohydrates. And we could start now, start the process of bringing food that went through the metamorphosis of cooking into our mouths. There it is, this calling. Things are calling for attention, strangely creeping their way into space, contouring out of the backdrops, swelling through the cracks. They appear at the edge of my field of vision. I cannot help but addressing this thing like another subjective being, wondering if it has feelings, intentions, agency. Maybe in lack of being able to think the world in anything else than object or subject. But that doesn't feel right. What is this urge about that you conjure up? What language does the calling speak? Which is your kin, your kind of agency? How can I comprehend your story? Quote, In South America, the immigrant peoples found a large variety of wild potatoes. But in contrast to those of North and Central America, they brought them into cultivation at an early stage of their settlement, possibly 2000 years or more before the Spanish conquest. Why people of the same original race should have behaved so differently on either side of the equator is a problem, the solution of which is almost certainly to be found in the extraordinary geographical and climatic conditions of the area into which the settles penetrated. The Andean range is folded along its length in such a manner that from the equator northwards, 
it is broken up into a fan-shaped structure of three divergent ridges with intervening valleys and plateaus which uniting at the equator continue south of it as a double chain as far as Pasco, latitude 11 degrees south. Only to diverge again into three parallel chains, which converge on one another at Vilcanota, latitude 14 degrees south. Once more the range splits into two, the chain remains bifid until latitude 30 degrees south, when it continues southward as a single ridge throughout the length of Chile, to fade out in Patagonia and the islands north of Cape Horn. When I think about the story of foods, I think about cultivation. This link between human being and non-human being. The human being shaping the land and the crops and the land and the crops enabling the human being or not. Several sources suggest different stories and prioritize different protagonists of those stories. Quote, the deep roots of how humanity transformed the globe pose a challenge to the emerging Anthropocene paradigm, in which human-caused environment change is typically seen as a 20th century or industrial era phenomenon. Instead, as recent archaeological research shows, it's clearer than ever before that most places we think of as pristine or untouched have been shaped by human societies for much longer. Quote, Potatoes were carried back on ship from South America to Europe, first to Spain in 1539. Regarding Ireland and UK, it may conceivably have reached those lands by accident between 1586 and 1599. There, hardy and easy to grow, potatoes were an inexpensive food that caught on quickly enough that the poor of Ireland were planting them in lazy beds by the early 1640s. Couch potato was first used by a 1970s comics artist who drew lazy, sedentary characters he called couch potatoes. From there, the phrase became an extremely popular way to talk about someone who spends so much time in front of the TV that she or he seems more like a vegetable than a human being. Take the potato or imaginary potato to your nose. Can you smell anything? 
Take it to your lips and notice its temperature and texture. If you start to dig your teeth or fingernails into it, you will notice how hard they are if unboiled. There's the skin, there's the starchy body. Smell again at the spot you broke the skin. What would happen if you would let it fall to the ground? An unstable ground. We travel from land to land, overland, digging into land, always in relation to gravity. Gravity that pulls us down towards something that is not stable. The ground is calling for attention, strangely creeping its way into space, contouring out of the backdrop, swelling through the cracks, appearing suddenly everywhere in my field of vision. Ground is formed by others. I'm grounding means that I am relying on other species' activities and a live, moving, shifting network of entities rather than a surface. How do we prepare ourselves to land on this kind of a ground? How do we tone our muscles, align our skeleton, direct our senses when we meet this kind of a ground? Some say a possible answer is contamination. We are all contaminated by encounters. We change each other. Purity is not even possible. Sometimes I'm not sure what happens when I allow proximity. Bubbles appear, shifting states and textures from solid to liquid to air, reacting and setting off more bubbles. In a large pot, cover potatoes with water and add a generous pinch of salt. Bring to a boil and cook until totally soft. 16 to 18 minutes. Drain and return potatoes to pot. Use a potato masher to mash potatoes until smooth. Meanwhile, in a small saucepan, melt butter with milk until warm. Pour over warm milk butter mixture and stir until completely combined and creamy. Add sour cream and stir until combined. Season mashed potatoes generously with salt and pepper. Transfer potatoes to a serving bowl and top with remaining two tablespoons butter. Place the potato in one or both of your hands or imagine to do so. Notice the weight, the temperature, the texture. Is it soft, hard? Is it the same all around, or can you make out details? What is the overall shape? The Great Famine or Irish Potato Famine in the 19th century was caused by both the potato blight which is a fungus-like microorganism, and the land organization through an absentee landlord, which means that a landlord fails to ensure the proper maintenance is done. So it was caused by a microorganism and a geopolitical system. The interweaving of microorganism and geopolitics. Or is it a juxtaposition? Or is one security effect of the other? 
This encountering of two forces pushing in the same direction, unintentionally maybe, caused about a million people to die and influenced the revolutions around 1848. Quote, potato growth can be divided into five phases. During the first phase, sprouts emerge from the seed potatoes and root growth begins. During the second, photosynthesis begins as the plant develops leaves and branches above ground and stolons develop from lower leaf axils on the below ground stem. As the potato plant grows, its compound leaves manufacture starch that is transferred to the ends of its underground stems. The stems thicken to form a few or as many as 20 tubers close to the soil surface. The number of tubers that actually reach maturity depends on available moisture and soil nutrients. At the end of the growing season, the plants, leaves and stems die down to the soil level and its new tubers detach from their stolons. The tubers then serve as nutrient store that allows the plant to survive the cold and later regrow and reproduce. Each tuber has from two to as many as ten buds or eyes arranged in a spiral pattern around its surface. The buds generate shoots that grow into new plants when conditions are again favorable.
Okay. Um, yeah, that was my work in progress piece. Thank you very much for, for watching. If there are questions in any time, otherwise I'm just going to talk, which is boring. <laughs> you can keep talking because at the moment we haven't had any questions come in, but um, do keep going because uh, uh, I have something to say, but do keep going and then I'll... Uh... Okay, great. Um, yeah, so maybe to say a little bit about, as I said, it's a work in progress, so it might also be interesting to share a bit about that process. Um, I think it already said in the um, in the text that, that was part of the um, uh, promoting this this uh, conference or or my contribution to it. I think it all um, actually started with with this moment, um, you know, wanting to cook a potato and then having it in my hand and pausing for a moment um, because of the sensorial moment. And I think it was quite interesting because this the sensorial moment kind of then prompted a, a reflection process that that I um, that I that I learned from Bruno Latour, who, um, you know, I guess I don't have to introduce in, in this conference here. Um, and I was so lucky to work with him for a while. And he always had this thing of saying, well, how does something, whatever you're working with, um, how did it get here? What does it depend on? How, what did it depend on in order to, to arrive here? So I started this fun, but really scary game also, I have to say, because, you know, you go from, okay, potato. So I got it from whatever supermarket. Um, so I kind of needed needed the supermarket to exist. I needed my bicycle to exist or the road to get there. And I needed the whole idea of, of trading money for something else. And I also needed um, the, the supermarket to trade with something else. And then I also, and so on and so forth. And you need, you know, the, the people who drive it there and the people who work there. And if you go further and further, you kind of get to this whole idea of, well, but I also needed the idea of farming to exist in this world and the earth and sun. And I also needed the idea of cultivation and this potato to actually travel continents that many hundreds of years ago. So so I, I really got into this complexity and I thought, well, that's amazing. Like this is what this non-human being in my hand is kind of telling me. But of course, it's my relationship to that. Um, and this back and forth of sensing something and then the reflection of the complexities, I think is what's quite crucial for my experience of, of being in the world and what effect it has on me, this being here, but also being entangled in this complexity. And I think I could say the same about um, the relationship I feel inside of myself between the various somatic sensorial movement practice and then a more conceptual look into entanglements. And I think I I felt that it could be very interesting to really look into this dialogue, like I already said in the introduction a little bit. Um, and so I, I also got quite interesting about, about language and different kind of languages and how do we use this kind of yeah, different kind of, of, of words. So the languages of, of a somatic teaching style of, of, of participation of scores of all of that, and then the poetic language of experiences and and also the, the the language of you know supposedly facts and and historical research and then you have all these different resources of that so it's not like i describing these these complexities i catch can just like state things that are just knowable of course i will have to look into research so to kind of i felt like in order to tell the story of this non-human being i kind of want to 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 um to almost in an essayistic style, bring these different things together and then bring in also the movement as a, as a moment of, of translating information and seeing what happens if I let movement translate information. Does that make me rethink what information is? Does it maybe add knowledge? Um, does it, what happens here to almost open a space where where the words and the articulation and and the things we know are a little bit in the you know vague again like open for definition as i guess a lot of 
art and, and some ecosomatic is doing anyway. So and that, that's really precisely the yeah. thing I was going to ask you about. Okay. That, that sort of very that beautiful uh, constant move between you know the physical potato, the slightly animated physical potato, uh, and then the reanimation of landscape through movement. Yes. Or the re the re the imagination of facts through movement uh, was very beautiful, very powerful, and um, I, I just wondered how you felt that felt that in yourself, how how, mm. how that felt to be as a moving body, um, w working against a, a narration which you, you've also provided as well. I just wonder what that felt like. Yeah, it was. Um... Uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the question. I think um, it, it felt really like multiplying myself in a, in a weird way, and 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 just just having and having the experience again of you know holding the potato and thinking about it, but in a very different way, and and feeling like, uh, well, I guess this beautiful moment of of pushing pushing whatever I, I thought I know before um, and I, I guess um, moving with information um, uh, always I think um, because it's part of my practice anyway and, and it always gives me that moment where I feel like I, I can process something in a, in a different way um, which enables me to um, how can I say that? Maybe not rethink what's being said, but kind of rethink how how much I'm relying on 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 facts and informations in order to know my place in the world. And I think that's that that for me was very interesting um, to and and also to be honest, it was really interesting to to research a bit into something that ordinary. And I really wanted something as ordinary as a potato. Um, to research into that and realize, wow, I mean, <laughs> like, 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 it's really like, a, you know, it's, it's a, it's an actor in this world, it, it shaped politics, it, it does shape politics, it is really not like we human beings have all the power or control, like, we know that, but then still reading it and, 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 and researching kind of confirmed that to me and then to try to bring that into movement was quite um challenging also yeah yeah i'm sure because i mean this is a very this becomes a very epic tale it becomes but, yes and this um, is also i think why it's a work in progress and and i wanted to keep it a bit into a more tutorial um diy essay style to not make it too big um, and I think I'm still working on that aesthetic like how can I grasp that fine line uh, you know for me the fact that there were two dancers uh, on the stage and that their interaction was quite intimate and the relationship with the text felt quite intimate yeah um, obviously took it to an interesting place and I wondered if you'd experimented at all with speaking that text live as you were moving rather than yes. going against the recorded which i'm assuming you're doing going against the recorded text yes we have many different like a whole research and and again i'm repeating myself horribly but work in progress so that's absolutely ongoing a, a lot of um research about how does text and movement relate which of course is in itself a huge not very new topic but like a huge topic um and uh, we we tried yeah speaking it live having other people moving rather than myself um and i think i do we are we're working on a live version rather where it would be the the, the reading pe uh, person would be on stage and would be a performer because i think it's very uh easy to have um the text as a given that is controlling yes. the whole thing yes. and, and the mover just to react to that and I think it would be quite nice to stage a moment where the movement can interrupt the text and and to like yeah um yeah it's that it's that moment when the text becomes embodied in a different way because exactly. again it becomes a uh 
there's a shift in the, that kind of actor relationship, isn't there? Absolutely. Where the text, as you say, is not a static being, but a, a, something that becomes part of the performative act. Absolutely. And I think I tried that a bit um, uh, through bringing in that many different sources to kind of make clear yeah. like it's not one narration, but that's definitely something I'm, I'm working on to to make that stronger. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Well, Mira, I think we'll draw this session to a close. Yes. So that we can uh, have a, a wee lunch break before we go into this afternoon session. Yes. But thank you so thank much you for joining us. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing your work. Uh, it's been great to have you. Thank you very much. Okay. Have you. a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.